Going into the series from this point, it's kind of important to have seen Begin's Night in retrospect, as its plot threads are picked up immediately in the arc that follows, the F Afterglow. Because damn it, everything is gay about this! With the Fang memory, first seen in the movie, revealed to have been covertly watching Philip this last year, as the next case comes in, with Fuyumi Aso wanting them to find the city's common Rider. You sure you're not asking them to track down Takeshi Asakura? Or for that matter, those violating the laws of time and causality? My god, you can prevent the Chodeno Colors trilogy! No, she's actually after a Dopont, arms, that's been riding up on a bike and stealing money shipments en route to local banks, taunting the survivors with his identity. And he gets away with it, mainly because Double is an urban legend, and aside from him wielding multiple weapons, no one has much of an idea of what Double is supposed to look like. Obviously, Shotaro's in to clear his name, using Bat to track it down, but in the chase, he drops a broken metal fragment. Akiko once more shows her growth from her early stunts by actually managing to perform a successful investigation, a background check on Fuyumi, which reveals she's actually an undercover thief, a member of the Twin Roses, a pair of gentlemen thieves in the Arsene Lupin style of bloodless and violence-free capers. When confronted with this, she freely admits it and explains that Arms is actually her former partner, Kenji Karata, who turned his back on their ideals once he caught a case of doping. Jeez, first a thief, then a drug addict. Gotta say, Abba Red fell a long way from being a responsible surrogate father. I can't wait until Shout Factory imports Abba Ranger. Now, she just wants to stop him from hurting anyone else, even if it means turning herself in, which is Shotaro's demand to continue on. And it's odd for him to demand something of a client like this, but the reason why is made clear as Philip's look up about a metal shard fails, and... It has to do with the slander they're suffering under. Kamen Rider It's something they earned. Yeah, as I've mentioned, Double is considered the reconstruction of the Kamen Rider franchise after years of, well, alienation and attempts to redefine what it meant to be one. While there is good content in the post-Ryuki, pre-Double years, you only need to look at the Hibiki staff change to see how badly the property was being managed. Many of the shows entirely removed from the identity of what Kamen Rider actually meant, especially if those who took on the title happen to be villains or act overtly villainous. Riku Sanjo, with how he's written Double Four's Drive and the related media, kind of clearly implies he disproves of that and other issues of portrayal in the prior years. If it's really what he's intending to do, he's not overt with it, but it is a running theme between the three shows he wrote on, and purportedly meant to be a larger aspect of Four's that got nixed by executives. But post Begins Night, that is now a storyline for the series, which ends up concluded in Double Forever. What does it mean to be a common writer? Though this musing and Shotaro's uncharacteristic impulsiveness to get this guy leads Philip to figuring out the fragment is part of a locker plate, dragging down the locale, and Kenji himself, who has totally lost it. <laughs> No, 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 no. The Forbidden Fruit turns you into a mutant or an inves. Do you even watch this show? Arms is physically stronger than Double, and much faster with his weapons use. And sadly, he's not working alone. This has all been a trap perpetrated by Sayako to nail Shotaro to a wall, the assembled forces quartering Akiko so she can be their hostage and force Double to power down. Philip, the driver's gunked up, preventing another memory insertion and thus causing the driver to time out the transformation, leaving Shotaro helpless and Philip, their true target, vulnerable, and approached 
by Sayako herself. Sa. Irasa. Daita. Now give your big abusive sister a hug! Philip is naturally shocked to hear this revelation. And before anyone comments to complain about the TV Nihon translator's notes saying Raito means to come and not light or right, as are the name puns with him being the light of the Sonozaki family and the right side of double, check the damn kanji it's spelled with. The one used for Rai has an entomology relating to fruit coming from trees. His spoken name is a two-level pun on his roles in life. His written name is a two-level pun referencing the fruit of knowledge and the tree of life, which are facets about him and his abilities. Only bring this up as the fandom got damn stupid over insulting this obviously wrong thing back in the day, when the spelling itself actually supports that interpretation while leaving them all as valid. I seriously do not understand the hate for TV Nihon the Tokusatsu fandom has when basic research refutes or contradicts most of their claims. Anyways, Sayako attempts to drag Raito home, Philip recognizing she only views him as a thing. <laughs> and his salvation comes from Fang, finally revealing itself and allowing Philip the time he needs to escape back to the office. But amidst this, Philip freaks out, flashing back to Begin's night and the terror he felt from losing total control of himself when he first used that memory. It was his first-hand exemplar of everyone that had ever used a memory he made thrown back in his face. And that experience led him to regretting his role in creating them and begin to walk his path of redemption. But part of why he's hidden himself away all this time is in the aftermath of his rescue, he built a wall around himself to protect himself from that fear, receding into the safety of the Gaia Library and the infinite knowledge of his books, with only Shotaro and now Akiko to drag him out of hiding himself away again. One detached view of the world into another, which he's only just escaped hiding forever in because of the two that are now in danger. Kenji calling on Shotaro's stag phone and orders he give himself up, or they will die. Shotaro shouts to Philip that his safety is more important, that it's his own damn fault for rushing in when Phil tried to warn him. <laughs> and he can't just abandon them, even though both he and Shotaro know what Fang does to him. <laughs> もう私の知ってる剣士じゃないよ。なんとかもう一度会ってみる。彼はもう sometimes it's worth the risk of self, to sacrifice of yourself, to save those you care about. Because damn it, everything is gay about this! Kenji constructs a death trap that's straight out of Jigsaw's wet dreams. And to her credit, this is really the moment where Akiko clicked as a character for me due to the injury she takes keeping Shotaro alive, showing she's more than moved beyond her early pettiness. Character development for the win! But Shotaro accepts his death, thanking Akiko for everything, only for his death to not come. Fang and Philip have arrived. <laughs> because damn it, everything is gay about this! And once again, Philip loses control, a berserker state ruled by fear, rampaging to protect itself. But it's different this time. Because the last year has built the two's partnership, their mutual trust beyond just a body and a soul, allowing Shotar to see that fear and enter the library himself to comfort the crying child and assure him 
he's not alone. <laughs> this cinches it. The physically strongest and fastest of Double's forms, Fang is a massive power upgrade for Double, allowing him to call upon three Fang blades from his arm, shoulder, and leg. But the power is at the cost of versatility, as only Joker has the fortitude of Double's memories to synchronize with it due to Shotaro's inherent compatibility with it, which he lacks with Metal and Trigger. This is explained in the Double novel, The One Who Continues After Z, that if they used those combos, Fang would never stop rampaging. I actually really like Fang Joker's look too, as he totally buy this as a more feral Double with the subtle style change of the suit. Plus, the white-black color contrast reminds me greatly of Two-Face and General Taoism. And of course, its finishing move is awesome! <laughs> Arms is beaten, but Fang immediately shows its limitation. Philip doesn't have the physical endurance to maintain the form for more than a short period before collapsing. The pair switching back to Chase after an observing Sayako, but in doing so, the pursuit ends up clearing their name when they abandon the chase to save a kid caught in the crossfire. As both of the thieves are turned in, Fumi doing as promised, Shotaro wonders if things are about to get worse, as Fang wasn't needed before this. Why is Fang only now come out of hiding is a pretty easy to answer question. Before the last few months, Shotaro's kept him at the office out of harm's way. Fang's primary duty is to see to Philip's safety, so that task was mostly being covered, thus no need to appear. That's only changed recently, with Akiko encouraging both of them to be more out of the office. And while that has done wonders for Philip's socializing, it has endangered him more. Farewell N, however, returns focus to Kirihiko. Or should I say, gives him focus, as... Well, he hasn't done much. Here, though, we do learn a great deal about him, facilitated through Shotaro unknowingly running into him at a barber shop, and the two get to talking, both of them loving the town and its idiosyncrasies, and Kirihiko even made a name for himself by designing the town mascot. I love you talking. <laughs> But when they catch sight of the other, the war faces come back on, Kirihiko revealing he believes Gaia memories are helping people to evolve, take back the town from corruption that has infested it, and those he chooses to sell memories to, like Magma and T-Rex, were those wrong that just wanted to make things right. So this arc shows how ironic Kirihiko's siding with Museum is with how they treat him. As he's... Not really deluded with his views, he's just not seeing the bigger picture or the damage he's doing. In many ways, it makes what follows a tragedy. The fight's broken off as the barber, Egusa, actually has a case for Shotaro. His daughter Akane has run away, having acted oddly beforehand. Shotaro takes the case, Kirihiko overhearing it and becoming curious about the character of his enemy. All the while Ryubi confronts Wakana about abandoning Clay Doll not so subtly intimidating her into taking it back. Shotaro gets a clue to Akane, leading to finding her with four of her friends living on the streets and stealing to get by, and when he tries to be a bit more forceful... Yeah, this is bad for several reasons. One, they're sharing it, so they're all becoming addicted. Two, they're not using living connector ports to jack it in, meaning the mutations of the memory cause are not being regulated in these specified interface pathways, so after a few uses, their use of it causes catastrophic rejection, to the point the only reason they don't die is from being rushed to intensive care. Gotta love Japan's universal single-pair healthcare laws for that. And three, they're kids. As another thing about Kirihiko and Museum, he has personally insured among the dealers that absolutely no one under 20 gets their hands on a memory. He is so shocked and outraged, he immediately goes to Sayako to demand who sold them it. As well, he doesn't care if adults abuse the memories they buy as, well, by the law, they can legally consent to all sorts of stuff that's bad for them. 
But kids, teens especially, tend to be impulsive idiots easily swayed. They should not have that temptation among everything else, especially with the museum using them all as disposable lab rats. As deep in the dark as Kirihiko is, this is his moral line. And it's what brings him into conflict with the museum, as Sayako sold them the memory. Akane tries to spin things, saying the second guy of the group, Toma, was the first to use it, and all of them were exhilarated by the freedom to freely fly through the sky. It made them feel as if anything was possible. Thus, to get that feeling all of the time, they left their homes and lives behind, using Bird to steal what they needed to truly be free. But the thing about people that run away from their lives is, well, sometimes what they leave behind is the cause, more often their problems are self-inflicted, so they just keep running. And thus, Toma, who used it most, was the first to fall, attacking more places to get them independent from all worries. It's from that knowledge that they're able to corner Toma as he's using Bird, confronting him with Fang Joker. I love this show so damn much. They succeed in injecting the memory, but oddly it doesn't break, Kirihiko confiscating it before confronting Double again. However, during this fight, Nazca stalls out, Shotaro only just avoiding a lethal blow. And he asks of him, if Kirihiko really wants to help people, then why is he hurting them? But the running analogy I made ends up far more appropriate, when Philip sees the living connector on Akane's arm. And with a quick look up, he connects the dots. Everywhere they've attacked is a business worked at or owned by the parents of students part of the same track and field team Akane was on before this. She says it was Toma, but... I and Philip don't buy it, as she also reveals she was the one it was given to, and she let her friends use it. Kirihiko, when he next returns home, catches sight of a secret room, entering it, only to find himself in the ruins of the Femme Shimu from, yeah, I mean, an underground excavation site below the city. What is that set anyways? It's always used in a number of series. Is it just a stock set or a real place? But Ryubi reveals it's where his family discovered a connecting fountain to the true guy memory of the Earth, one piece of it having manifested deep under Futo. And this moment answers why Museum has set themselves up here, and why the city is the only region known capable of producing Gaia memories. They need proximity to the true Gaia memory to be able to pull free its knowledge for placement into these devices, as well as to even research it. With it literally being under their house, they have an undisputed monopoly on it. Ryubi reveals, yeah, they intentionally gave the bird memory to kids. It's been a memory that's been frustrating to develop, as all of its users burn up too fast. They thought kids would be more resilient, but even they didn't expect them to share it, just as Sayako delivers another copy to Akane for her to use and complete their testing of the memory. And this is Kirihiko's line. And his heart tells him to do the right thing. Screw museum, screw Gaia memories, screw human evolution. You don't go after kids. And he's going to save them, even if it kills him. Which it is. His body is rejecting Nazca. His freeze-up in the battle earlier, a sign its use is slowly tearing his body apart. But still he endures, helping Double hold Bird down long enough for them to zero in on the memory in Akane to break it from within. Akane and her friends were saved because when he was confronted with the reality of his deeds, he chose to make up for them. <laughs> and as his final act, he tries to offer the same epiphany to Sayako, asking her to run away with him, leave this madness because he truly does love her. However, it wasn't mutual. He was merely a pawn to be used, abused, and abandoned. 
A man whose deepest wish was to help others, in the end, was just another victim. <laughs> but at least he went out as a hero. Kirigo's exit is actually a turning point in the series, and in a way, I think a bit of damage control. As I've said, Riku Sanjo is not good with larger casts, and while he was giving Kirihiko stuff to do so he wasn't superfluous, none of it really mattered. Most of what he did was facilitate exposition on museum side of stories that anyone could do. There was nothing really wrong with him, and there was nuance to him as the Farewell End arc showed, but there wasn't anything essential that required his continued inclusion, so jettisoning him makes sense. It's sad, but it says a lot about the show that when it did chose to fully develop his character, it became one of its most outstanding arcs with its plotting and insight, which would push the show into even greater heights simply to measure up. The character that replaced him, however, many considered to be the series' breakout character. Which brings us to The Eye That Doesn't Stop, and the introduction... <laughs> The Man in Red. This is Ryu Terui, police superintendent who has just been assigned to take over the Dopan crime unit, and he wants to hire the Nerubi agency for ongoing consulting work, revealing a case of people being frozen solid. I want an APB put on our Jack Frost, Missouri Shiryuki, Waishni, and Kuzan Aokiji. No, I don't want one on Schwarzenegger! <laughs> And yet, he came to them. Think about that for a second. They get a report of another victim, Shotaro getting the down low on Ryu from Jino, who's now one of Ryu's subordinates. And Ryu has had a special interest in Dopant crimes for some time, as they filter it out of Futo slightly. But the first clue for the group comes from a flower in the home that hasn't been frozen. And Ryu recognizes it. Busa. Then how will we communicate and learn important contextual details? Asking questions in an investigation environment is a good thing, as it leads to the uncovering of answers. If you don't ask, then all you have is supposition and unverifiable information. And yeah, this is Ryu's catchphrase. To be fair, it's used better elsewhere where it's not condescending, but as a quirk is something endemic to the character trying to assert his authority in situations where it's either unneeded or outright rude. In this instance, he hired Shotaro implicitly to assist in this exact kind of thing. So asking for context on why he has an odd reaction, is Shotaro doing the job you hired him for? They go to the hospital to check on the victim, only to encounter a Dopont, and Ryu's ready to fight it himself. <laughs> Who the hell would make something that heavy? It literally takes Ryu six freaking years before he's able to buff up enough to fight with that thing like it were a normal sword. And even then he struggles with it. The best he can do right now is drag it and use his momentum to swing it awkwardly. <laughs> and yeah, the show keeps saying Shotaro's a reckless fool, but in his debut episode, Ryu far more fits that description with how consumed with anger he is. Ryu demands he transform, startling Shotaro as despite how he's transformed in front of clients before, the mess with the arms Dopant shows double is still considered an urban legend at this time in the series, and with Ryu recently having returned to town, there's no way he should know that at all. How he does is clever seating. Since begins night, Ryu has been surveying the agency, either in person with his movie cameo, or by his own beetle phone memory gadget part of the subplot in the FNN arcs. The Dopant gets away, the pair seeing a woman in the aftermath, leading back to the office where Ryu barges into the back, and demands a keyword search. あんた、俺はいずれ仮面ライダーになる男だ。この街の連中はドーパンとを倒す超人を仮面ライダーと呼ぶんだろう。ならば俺が変わる。ダブルでは力不足だ。Well, yeah, that's the rule. Versatile riders are weaker before their final form to balance their flexibility. 
This is the point Ryu has begun to grate on everyone with his attitude, Philip doing the look up and finding the flowers from a local business. The woman they saw its owner, Makiko Katahara. After getting to the place, they only find her son, who Ryu manhandles to learn her location, leading to an amusement park. Shatar is left alone to find her, as Ryu is drawn aside by a masked woman who delivers his... equipment. In finding Makiko, Shatar ends up facing the Dopont, Double's heat forms freezing over as the dual memory use doesn't give them a perfect immunity. Thus, it's time for a little backup. And when you think about it, Axel is a pretty appropriate concept to base a memory off of. Not just because of Axel's bike motif, in fact changing into his own vehicle form, which is kind of cool, but all the things you could translate acceleration into. Not just speed, but thermal energy, force, types of movement. It's why he starts out being four times stronger than double, on average with most Showa riders in his power tier despite it being established that refined Gaia memories used individually are supposed to be weak, as his driver can better attune the output of it back to higher performance levels, in part from how he can charge up his own abilities. But despite a stellar debut battle, what he fought was a clone of the Dopants, chasing after it again, only to find Makiko with the memory, and for Ryu to go psycho. Shotaro blocks him from hurting someone defenseless, all of them thinking he's insane. And in this one instance, everything is explained. Ryu Terui is another victim of the Dopant crime wave. His family frozen to death, and right now, he is still consumed by the grief of that loss, and his desire to make the person responsible pay. If Shotaro and Philip are comparable to Takeshi Hongo and Hayato Ichimanji, to not even bring up the Black and Shadow Moon illusions they also bear, then this in turn makes him the character who parallels Shiro Kazumi, beginning his arc at the same point V3 did his. Reeling, in pain, wanting someone, anyone to take that out on, and someone to step in and get him past that. Approaching the Narumi agency not just to assist him in getting his vengeance, but as a cry for help. <laughs> Ryu, for many, became the breakout character because he's the one with the most tangible arc to him. From this revenge-driven madman a hair trigger away from becoming everything he hates, back into the good man his family would have been proud of. And that character journey is only facilitated because of Shotaro confronting him and calling out his actions. Again, to contrast against characters I despise, this horrid behavior is not glorified or excused by virtue of them being or becoming a significant character, but sought to be corrected, and is shown to be corrected. Not hand-waved away so the audience never actually sees a change, but over the following arc, you witness him turn away from this with simple guidance and him witnessing others doing just as he wanted to, and how if Shotaro, Philip, and Akiko not reached out, he could have become just like them. No better than the man who killed his family. The element of what a commoner is this arc presents is thus one of responsibility. In one's use of their powers, in one's duty to help others, and to own up to one's mistakes. But right now, that burning anger has made him blind to anything else, as those flowers at the scene were also at his own family's murder the double memory clue given to him by his father, who had held on just long enough to mention it before he succumbed. And he doesn't want to listen to them. Why? 
の心の叫びまで検索できるのかハードボイルドあああいう男をそう呼ぶんじゃないのかい you keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Makiko goes missing as Philip finds there's no double memory that has the ability to freeze people solid. Oh, irony for later. Meaning Ryu's hunt and the case aren't related. All while Ryu trails Makiko's son Kiyoshi until he meets up with his mom, speaking words that intentionally condemn what she's doing, and Ryu falling straight for it and trying to kill her again. Fun Joker intercedes, the lot thrashing him for his obsession, where he finally does reveal to them the whole story. After his family was killed the previous August, he was approached by his benefactor, Shroud, who gave him Axel and his sword to begin training himself, encouraging him to submerge himself in anger to become strong. As well strong in body he is, strong in mind he ain't, as he twice now just tried to kill an innocent woman. As the real Dopont is her son. Makiko was covering for him, as she felt it was her responsibility for failing him and letting him become a criminal. A series of slander about her business tactics noted earlier, just a string of her taking the blame for the bullshit Kyoshi has pulled. Her son is a petty, spiteful man-child who thinks the world should be given to him, and is someone that has just been given power. The flowers he left, also to paint his mom, as culpable as he's only recently obtained his memory, meaning what Ryu thought was a clue was only leading him to commit the same sin as the one he's chasing on his first day. Despair awaits beyond your goal indeed. And here does Ryu begin to change, starting with him noting Shotaro's worth and the difference between them. Ryu's closed himself off, but Shotaro's endeavor to reach out, and become the hero of the people. He may have called it naive, but Shotaro's convictions, and those of a true common rider, saved him from himself that day. To see the world for what it is, not what they want it to be, and still do what they can to make it better. Thus, when they confront Kyoshi in his Dopant form, Ryu is far more in control. And when given the chance to unleash a killing blow, he visibly stops himself. For Shotaro has shown he can be better than that. However, Ryu's case isn't quite closed. And as I've been avoiding the pun, I'm contractually obligated to do it. It's kind of binding. What killed the dinosaurs? Ice oh! Age! Yeah, this was not the double Dopont Ryu was after. The real killer is instead met by the Sonozaki sisters. A bitter wind is coming. The tea returns continues Ryu's arc with him becoming involved in a sting operation to weed out an officer leaking information to in museum. He fights off some mosque raids as the corrupt cop escapes, <laughs> only to get some unexpected backup from... Ayumi Kinoshita. Ow! Wow, one of the Decker Rangers joining the show for an arc. This is going to be so awesome! She's the villain, isn't she? Triceratops! Because, of course. The ironic thing is, this is actually a Makura focused arc, since Ryu's role in the show allows both cops a bit more of a reason to exist. With Ayumi's character Ayakujo slipping into their unit after she's returned from extended duty in Los Angeles. Ah, so that's where SPD was located. Yeah, that's the in-joke Koichi Sakamoto's directing this arc. Anyways, Makura's felt even more of a fifth wheel since he's a junior detective, 
wanting to hire Shotaro to help him become a better detective to upstage Aya, since he really sucks at his job. So go. Wait a second, that's the human form of Roid Mute 092! And people say my theory of the Roid Mute's infestation of the police retroactively explaining their ineptness during Heisei Kamaradori is ridiculous. Shotaro's contacts lead to them finding the other mole in the police, Akutsu, who is also being surveyed by Ryo and Aya as he commits a criminal act. Makura leaping in to accuse him without anything more as evidence. Like a fucking imbecile. And also, the real Japanese cops this character was created to, one, imitate, and two, condemn. As a result, Akutsu flees, only to be attacked by Barney the Dinosaur. I am totally on board with this sequel to Death to Smoochie. Double defends the corrupt cop, and from the exchange, Ryu finds a phone strap. But to elude that I is the dope aunt if I hadn't already spoiled it, an injury double inflicted upon the pink triceratops, this is oddly foreshadowing on multiple levels to cure Ryuja, isn't it? Is also seen being suffered by Aya when they get back to the office, both Ryu and Philip catching sight of that while Shotaro is occupied. But when asking about Migazuchi, the person Aya is impersonating as Tricera, we learn that Migazuchi was her former partner, and her lover. After encouraging her to go off and achieve her career in America, he was framed for taking bribes and was then summarily murdered while his death covered as a suicide. This is a toothless, silly series based on worthless content not worth respecting, according to Toei. And thus, why Aya is doing all this. Justice twisted into revenge, just like Ryu. As much as his introductory arc was about forcing Ryu to look at himself and what he's doing, this one is confronting him with someone just like himself, with their motivation to find and confront those responsible for their loss, and seeing how the road he walked could so easily destroy him. Like he's looking into a mirror, darkly. And that's the inherent tragedy of this arc. Aya is not a villain. She wanted to clear Migazuchi's name by revealing the crimes of those who framed him, only for her use of the memory to twist her ambitions. They obtain Akutsu's location, a houseboat, and confront him, but he's called in backup from Museum to allow him to escape, meaning Axel faces his nemesis, Smilodon, for the first time. As a reminder, Axel's greatest foe in this series is a freaking cat. So Akutsu gets away on his houseboat, only for it to explode, thanks to Triceratops. <laughs> And Ryu let her do it, as he does understand. But to show how his arc is already progressing, he asks that she stand down now that she's gotten her revenge. Unfortunately, the memory corruption has already gone too far, as she wants to take down Museum. And hey, that is another understandable goal, but it's too big to do half-cocked. <laughs> Damn it, Terui, we just went over this! See why I equate that to an expression for don't defy me? Though Philip does question Shotaro's decision to defend her just because now she wants to fight Museum. The man citing Kirihiko as someone whose morality survived Gaia memory use. And while they don't know about the Gaia drivers protecting the commanders from that, it's still out of character for him to be so nonchalant and hypocritical in this case, as they've already seen Aya murder people of her own free will, making this little different than the T-Rex incident. Only Shotaro doesn't know this woman personally to think he can talk her down. It's almost as if this were a filler episode being written by Keiichi Hasegawa or something. Ryu sent a call taunting him about his family's murder, only for the caller to bury him under construction materials, as Shotaro finds Aya at the coast, asking her to surrender. Aya 
Aya asks for a day, as she has a lead on the commanders, Shotaro once more acting out of character and letting her, which only lets her make a deal with the sisters. For she, in fact, is already too far gone, agreeing to kill Jino to gain Taiko's trust, and as a precursor to killing Shotaro. Detectives are tipped off to this betrayal when Ryu's beetle phone intercepts them with a picture of who tried to kill him, and at this point she's not even trying to make excuses. All because the place he loved rejected him? Yeah, no, people did that. And yes, Saiko instantly recognized the mental degeneration from memory use upon meeting her, agreeing with Aya's request simply to get her away so she could self-destruct far away from them. But it seems that now... Aya just sucks at killing people, as Ryu survived the prior incident with barely any damage, too stubborn to die. That was you literally not even two episodes ago, dude. Still, Double hangs back so Axel can more thoroughly learn this lesson for himself, in hopes he won't repeat his past actions. Triceratops assuming a larger monster form, and Shroud sending Axel his own support vehicle, the Gun Array, which Axel can dock with in bike mode to charge up an energy cannon designed for dealing with kaiju form dopants. Still to wrap things, Makra has ultimately learned something from all this, to not take things at face value, as after discovering everything about what happened to Aya and her lover, he wants to continue to be better as a detective, and not just assume things of others. L on the lips brings Queen Elizabeth in as clients. See, they're a singing duo, a detail set up during the tea arc with them dragging Shotaro to karaoke, and also them being played by then-current members of the Akihabara Idol Group, AKB48, and they recently got a chance to perform on Futik Idol, a local program which can give aspiring musicians a record deal if they continue to win on it for long enough. And judged by the singers of Devil's opening theme, dear gods that's meta, Ayakamiki and Takia, with the third judge being... My god, that's Ichiro Mizuki, the most acclaimed musical composer for Japanese media the man crowned emperor of anime music, having recorded over 1,200 tracks since the 70s for everything, including all major tokusatsu series, Go Lion, Mobile Suit Gundam, Lupin the Third, and so many others, alongside being a founder of the ever-awesome Jam Project. This is a fantastic cameo! Well, if anyone knows competence in musical composition, it should be them. Showcased by Queen Elizabeth's performance of their single, Love Wars, which, on the show, gets them... tossed out? <laughs> the hell is wrong with you? That song is so good, it's been on my MP3 player since I first heard it. What could have you possibly thought is better than that? Ah! Why the fuck does Toy keep doing that? Are you the god of the underworld because you sound like Hades crushing Hercules? Best compliment ever. Though sadly this idiot, Jimmy Nakata, I find a better composer than Nomka Neal's atonal dreck. But the girls lead Shotaro to this dude as an example of the only man who's actually winning on the show now. And it's more than enough for him to take the case. As anyone who likes this awful composition has to be affected by a dopant. This is like that time when America's Got Talent derided the ability of Lindsay Sterling. Ugh. Thus, Team Narumi joined the audience of the next show, and as the whole thing shows with their contrast to the audience's enjoyment, they are certainly being mind-screwed. And it only seems to be benefiting Jimmy, who on top of his awful music, is acting like an arrogant jackass. However, part of the show allows audience performances. Philip dragging Shotaro on stage due to a bout of research binging, the two of them performing a pretty damn good cover of Finger on the Trigger, one of Double's insert themes. And above them, drawn out by the surprise performers, is the Liar Dopants, which Ryu engages, appearing to defeat it, 
only to be affected by its power. As liar has the ability to twist people's perception with its words. Any lies spoken, superseding reality for its victims. In Ryu's case, thinking the remains of a broken memory is made of trash. <laughs> the search for a liar leads to a street artist who set up his shop near Jimmy's public stage, seeing nothing wrong with this twist music. Which makes Shotar realize there was someone else that wasn't inflicted with pain by it, a woman named Yukiho, who is revealed to be working herself to death. And tailing her exposes the reason is so she can pay off Liar to keep Jimmy winning, as she is that infatuated with him. But Liar refuses to cover more events as she doesn't have enough money. So plan out additional installments, idiot? She's a repeat customer! You could always just threaten to destroy Jimmy's career if she doesn't! With their knowledge of Liar's power, the writers initially do well, until Akiko's attempt to talk down Yukiho backfires when she reveals she too despises Jimmy's performances. Just as Jimmy arrives at the scene, called by Liar as a consequence of Yukiho's failed payments. And thus, with this distraction, everybody's hit with Liar's powers. <laughs> I love this show so damn much. And we'll continue the L on the Lips case next time.